this machine does is swim. Lifeless eyes. Black eyes, like a doll's eye. It's a carcarin and carcarin. When he comes at you, it doesn't seem to be living. To kill him, it's a maniac. Until he bites you. You're gonna need a bigger boat. We are the Shark Addicts a group of Florida locals who operate a shark-free diving charter out of one of the world's sharkiest coastlines, Jupiter, Florida. Our mission, educate the world about sharks and the role they play in our environment, while dispelling the myths and legends that have long been associated with these incredible creatures. We are headed to Guadalupe, Mexico to come face to face with the king of the ocean, the great white shark. What's up, fools? What's up? This man only eats Dunkin' Donuts for breakfast. Oh, I'm going there. This is, I'm bringing in to put on my Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> extra, <laughs> extra, extra quadruple bacon this time? Yeah. So, this is the view from our hotel room. Pretty sweet. San Diego, about to go walk that way. As the crew strolled through the streets of San Diego to find the first West Coast Dunkin' Donuts in hopes of keeping Cameron alive, the buzz of anticipation begins to rise. Our East Coast dives have brought us face to face with plenty of large sharks, from 15 foot tiger sharks to 16 foot greater hammerheads, but nothing quite compares to the size and power possessed by the infamous great white shark. How's that for fun? You know what? I'm on the official tourist site for San Diego tourism. Matt made a big mistake by tipping and talking to the guitar guy. That's what's oh, up. Oh yeah. I also got one of the greatest guitars that anyone's ever had was given to me two years ago by my crazy drummer friend Jay told him I need a guitar. I have a DR Mon. Look that one up on the internet. Nobody has a DR Mon guitar because they only well, made them. heard of this brand and we're like, no nah, dude, we don't play guitars or not into music, you know, we're shark diving. And then Fender bought the company out because they made the best guitar pickups for the whole world. Yeah. The guitar, do you play? So I made a mistake. The guitar, no, not. you can do feedback with the tone control, which is, I'll bet there are none, I'll bet if I take it into the music store, they'll offer me $2,000 for it, and I won't take it. <laughs> no. I mean, I played it. I was out there at the gas line. You should, you should have. Of course, you gotta hit Dunkin' Donuts. I start my mornings with DD. Luckily, I found one of the first ones that opened there in San Diego. Eats Dunkin' Donuts every day. He's like, oh, let me get a triple bacon, blah, blah, with iced coffee, with cream sugar, blah, blah. <laughs> and it was like two seconds, and the guy was like, oh, you're not from here. We did Dunkin' Donuts, walked around San Diego, met the guitar guy. Ready to rock and roll. Perfect. On the way back to the hotel, I rolled my ankle. That was nice. Man hopped on the bus, headed to Guadalupe. Ay, ay, ay. So we stopped at a 7-Eleven on our way down to Ensenada. Uh, these two fools grab some beers. And I get to the counter and they're trying to speak to me in Spanish. I don't know, like Spanish. Cameron's all stoked. They have 40 ounce beers, which we don't have in Florida. So they were talking about pesos and dollars and I didn't know if I bought the beer or if I didn't. I don't know what happened, but he didn't buy his beer. He bought it and he left it. And I was kind of confused on what just went down. One of the guys on the bus grabbed my beer for me and delivered it to me. So. Hey, so what just happened? Yeah. Uh, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the beauty of it. You set it up with the Dos Equis. Cheers. Cheers, amigo. <laughs> to great white sharks. That's just right? So we roll up to Ensenada. Port, and there she was, the Solmar 5, 
sitting pretty, looking beautiful. And just to think in 24 hours we'll be coming face to face with gray white sharks. From the moment we stepped on the Solmar 5, it was just unbelievable service. Ah, How you doing, guys? The crew worked night and day, um, literally 16 hour days, up all night making sure all the systems were working. Shower and bathroom in there, you got everything you need. And then on your bed is a bottle of tequila, just waiting for you. <laughs> Free bottle of tequila when you come. How awesome is that? Like most things in life, preparation and execution lead to the success of any operation. The Solmar 5 and its crew are beacons of professionalism in an industry surrounded by the ever-changing conditions of the blue wild. Safety is their top priority in a world where animals shaped by millions of years of evolution glide beneath the vessel day and night. More over here, there's so many. As we embarked on our voyage, escorted by pods of dolphins, the question on our minds remains. Will the Great White live up to its Hollywood reputation? Or is there something more to this apex predator? To understand this, we have to go back. Back to America's first widespread shark encounters. Back to events that shaped the legend of this incredible species. Shark attacks and encounters were so unheard of in the early 1900s that fairs used to hold cash prizes for seagoers who could prove they'd been bitten by sharks. Years later, during the summer of 1916, a massive heat wave pushed its way across the Northeast. And for the first time collectively, thousands of inland dwellers flocked to the shores of New Jersey to escape the scorching temperatures. That summer marked one of America's most deadly string of shark attacks recorded to date with four deaths reported by sharks in less than two weeks. Fishermen sprung into action, calling for an all-out assault on sharks up and down the New Jersey coastline. While some speculated it was the work of a juvenile great white, the location of several attacks placed upriver suggests that the bull shark was the culprit due to its ability to tolerate brackish and freshwater environments. The string of attacks and deaths associated would go on to serve as the inspiration behind Peter Bensley's Jaws, solidifying the shark as a terror of American folklore. Yet with each passing year, the terror of New Jersey's 1916 summer began to fade from memory. July 30th, 1945. Amidst the Battle of World War II, the USS Indianapolis battleship steams across the Pacific Ocean to the Philippines. The Indianapolis has just completed the most top secret mission in United States military history to date, delivering the atomic bomb to Tinian Island. When a Japanese submarine slams torpedoes right into her side, the esteemed warship sank in a matter of minutes, and nearly 1,200 sailors entered the water. Only 316 would survive the next five days at sea, succumbing to dehydration, burns, and the worst collective shark attack in U.S. history. Survivors would recount the horrible scene of fins slicing through the water, crediting the tiger shark and oceanic white tips as the main culprits of devastation. The bone-chilling account would later serve as the inspiration of Captain Quint on the 1975 summer blockbuster Jaws, and sharks would pay the price. Um, the fear of sharks sort of built up through the 1900s after they had uh, some high-profile shark attack cases. And then obviously Jaws, which I think is a great film, but Jaws terrified a lot of people, which is his point. Um, but I don't think Steven Spielberg expected it to have the backlash it did on, on people's views of sharks. And I think some of that is, I mean, obviously there, there's top predators that will kill you. You know, if you go to safari, you don't go up, up to the lions. Uh, if you're going into the jungle, you don't go looking for tigers. And yet, none of those animals give people the fear that sharks do. And probably part of that is that it's just not natural for us to be in the water. We're not marine animals. And so you go into a, a medium where you can't see, things are unknown, you can't breathe in it, you can just float on the surface, um, and that makes it scarier. But it's important to remember that these animals aren't malicious. They're not doing it for any evil reason. They just do what they need to do to survive, and that's all that they care about. Yeah! I 
I've never been in a cage until today. Why is it that we have to be in a cage here in Guadalupe? These are very large predators that include marine mammals in their diet. So the, the cages um, it is for everyone's safety. It's just a different species to work with. If you are out in the water there, if you start behaving in any way like prey, and by that I mean like you're not a very strong swimmer or you're not feeling comfortable, you, you act like prey, you they can treat you like prey. prey. Yo, Cam. Cameron. Cameron. What up? Get to work, dude. The shark addicts crewed by trade are free divers. We dive without tanks, pulling in deep single breaths of air before dropping down below the surface, allowing us minutes at a time to interact with sharks. For great whites surrounding the islands of Guadalupe, the name of the game is patience. They'll find you. All you need to do is be there. And each cage is supplied with an infinite amount of air through a hookah line system that runs from a compressor to the divers below. With a steady supply of oxygen, the team descends beneath the surface and waits. Waits for the legend of the deep to find them. And it doesn't take long. slow thrust of its tail, the great white slowly makes its way to the diver's cage. Curious, lured by scent, until the shark and shark addicts come face to face. sharks were coming real close to the cage you know they were eyeballing you and checking you out and you could know that you know there's more to them than just a killing machine they're very intelligent you know 400 plus million years of evolution finally getting to encounter these massive creatures um, was just an unbelievable experience especially being in the, the 40 foot down cage you just felt like it was just you and them they come from 100 feet down and in two seconds they'd be right in front of you with it went right under the cage. So not only did you get to swim with these unbelievable sharks for six to eight hours a day, you also got to take a chance to ride a panga, which is a small vessel um, used to get you closer to the island. A really cool perspective of the island and the formation of how it all became volcanic rock. And then the most unbelievable thing happened. We uh, got closer to the cage where the bait was. And then as we're getting back to the boat, two big great whites came over to check out the boat. You could see them from the boat, you know, coming straight up at you and you see the, like the light on their belly. Pop my camera in the water real quick. It, got, it went under the boat so we switched sides. Matt's like bouncing the boat so I don't fall in. I'm like halfway out. And we were just surrounded by two to three just massive white sharks, 12, 14 foot maybe. It almost seemed like a scene from Jaws, except we didn't get knocked off our boat, the shark didn't come take a bite of the boat, just came to check out what was floating on the surface and identified, hey, that's something that I don't really want to mess with, and down she went. The island of Guadalupe is one of the premier places to find great white sharks. From feeding on seals and sea lions to reproduction, great white sharks can be seen around the island for six to eight months out of the year. This makes it an irreplaceable location to study great whites through satellite tagging, point of view camera systems, and other important research techniques to help unlock the mysteries of this incredible species. 14 foot great white. That's a big shark. It's bigger than the boat we're here. Look at that thing. All operations are closely monitored by the Mexican National Park Service to record sharks by a variety of numbers and ensure tourism operations are taking place safely. Uh, my name is Elizabeth. 
am a park ranger from the National Commission of Protected Areas. That's a government institution. So we take care and we manage all the uh, national parks, the biosphere reserves and so. And right here in Guadalupe, I am uh, working as an observer. So I need to, uh, to uh, register all the behavior of the sharks, how to attack the bait. So all this in order to, to check if the management the control is working. We need to check if, the, if all the touristic boats are doing all the activity according to this this kind of this kind of code. It's very rarely do you see predation on the surface here. What we do see is um, very recently killed seals, sometimes floating up to the surface, which makes us think that they might be hunting down deeper. And that's one of the reasons we want to put the cameras on to see if we're getting stuff to go that deep. And part of that might be because the visibility out here is so good that if you're a seal on the surface and you're looking, it's not easy to ambush. I mean, that's how white sharks they seals work, they ambush them. Or well, that's how we think they do it on the surface. We know that's how they do it in South Africa. But it's murky water there, so they can get up relatively close with their camouflage and then ambush. Yeah, They're not pulling that off out here. Exactly. So they may though have the advantage down deep if those seals are still going down and doing their dives deep, which they do. Um, it might be a different story. So we don't know what's going on down there. We've had a little bit of footage where we can see um, white sharks chasing bat rays down there. Um, but until we understand uh, what they're feeding on, in terms of what their ecosystem affects are, it's kind of hard to say. Dr. Yanni and the rest of their team, what they're doing out there is pretty amazing with all the tagging of the sharks they're doing to retrieve data that has not been reported yet to get a better understanding of what they're doing there. There's a couple people on the boat that have been on, you know, 10 to 15 trips and they had this book with all the named sharks in Guadalupe. Uh, in the book they had 229 named sharks with I think 24 pending. Being able to share this experience with these sharks where they naturally congregate these feeding grounds and these mating grounds for these sharks, just an unbelievable experience that really just changes your perspective on these creatures. Leaving the island was bittersweet, we didn't want to go, but you know, I can't, can't live there, there's nothing really there, <laughs> unless you're going to join those seals. The fear of sharks that gripped America, and in most cases the world, has had the strongest impacts on shark populations across the globe, down nearly 90% in some pelagic species due to commercial overfishing, culls, and the fin trade, the danger of eutrophication and imbalance of the world's oceans has never been higher. More than 200 million sharks are killed every year, and these animals play an irreplaceable role within the ecosystems mankind depends on as a major food source across the globe. If sharks fail, the oceans fail. The opportunity to dispel the fear of the last hundred years has never been more accessible than it is today. Ecotourism charters have opened up a new frontier promoting conservation through education and allowing people to experience face-to-face -face these apex predators safely in the wild. Thankfully, the demonized stigma of the white shark is coming to a close. A beacon of hope exists for this once widely hunted predator as the necessary research is gathered to better protect and ensure their survival for future generations to live alongside, gliding beneath the surface, respected and revered as king of the ocean. <laughs>